The rise of Ghana as an African superpower. Ghana is the land of gold, kente clothing and cocoa beans. Talk to people about Ghana and they may ask, where is that? Well, Ghana is pretty much geographically at the very center of the world. Found on Africa's west coast, Ghana sits at a strategic position, both economically and geographically. Ask what time it is in Ghana and the answer is pretty simple, as it's exactly the same as Greenwich Mean Time. Ghana is one of a handful of countries vying for the title of closest to the equator, so you aren't likely to find many climates as tropical as this one. In fact, Ghana only really has two seasons, one wet and one dry. Ghana's port city, Accra, is the commercial hub of the country. It's also Ghana's most populated city and the seat of its government. Ghana's history includes myriad tales that come together to explain how the country has gotten to where it is today. The area now known as Ghana has seen battles with many African countries and was many African countries and was colonized by European nations over the last 2000 years. In 1957, Ghana became the first self-governing country on the African continent under President Kwame Nkrumah. Today, Ghana's president is Nana Akufo Addo, and the country continues to be a strong force in the economy and development of Africa. Ghana is also an affordable location to visit, since a dollar will get you 5.78 cities, and the cost of living is one fifth of what it is in North America. The population of Ghana lives in a cosmopolitan metropolis and the government recognizes a host of indigenous languages as national languages. Two of the most widespread of these are the Twi language of the southern and central regions and the southern and Dagbani languages of the Dangomba people, more commonly spoken by people in areas to the north. Today most Ghanaians identify as Christian, however, the native religion of the influential Ashanti Empire was a form of this faith tradition and are still active today and are a big part of Ghanaian culture. They are combined with Christian traditions too. The Ashanti Empire was influential in shaping the culture of modern Ghana and fashion is no exception. Kente cloth, the fabric worn by Ashanti, is still a point of national pride. Now let's dive into the main issue here. How exactly Ghana fostered economic growth in such a quick spell of time that economists still have their heads spinning? Two years ago, Ghana was referred to as the world's fastest growing economy, with terms such as skyrocketing being used to describe its growth. This change has occurred in only three decades, and for any country with a history of ups and downs, this is an exceptional achievement. This was largely made possible due to good governance and sustainable development seemed to have done the trick. The government has always set its focus on Ghana's economy ever since they gained independence. By the late 90s, the success of Ghana's cocoa crops brought over from the Equatorial Guinea seemed to be securing the country's status as an up-and-coming economy to be reckoned with. But all too soon the drop in the price of cocoa meant that the booming economy started to slow down. Although Ghana was also a big exporter of gold and had wealth of natural resources, the country's heavy reliance on cocoa exports saw the dip in Ghana's economy, taking a toll on all aspects of life for Ghanaians. The country faced significant challenges and Ghana's economy was far from being the fastest growing economy in Africa. Good governance began with government officials upping their commitment to getting better at governance. This meant taking note of what the country really needed and making decisions informed by Ghana's past, present and future. And this good governance brought about something remarkable in the 90s. Ghana's economy was being strengthened and not by some new commodity the country could sell. 
The strength came from a more structured and equitable system of governance, the new government's transparent democracy. The government looked to strengthen society and industry through economic reform. By the mid-90s, Ghana was once again experiencing rapid economic growth. Thanks to good governance put forward in policies and plans looking to improve the quality of life for Ghanaians, these gains were boosted in 2007 with the discovery of offshore oil and Ghana's economy was showing signs bursting at the seams. Ghana has consistently ranked in the top three countries in Africa for freedom of speech and press freedom. In the early years of independence, the country approached reform with the Economic Recovery Program ERP. This program has its focus on urban issues and sidelines the challenges faced by rural communities. In this way, the ERP overlooks the connections between rural and urban communities and how one community could benefit from improvements in the other. Since the start of Ghana's independence, the wealth of rural communities lacked well behind that of city dwellers. Bridging this gap in equality meant bringing better access to jobs and better pay for rural people. And by 1997, the Ghanaian government had come up with a plan. Good governance had brought with it some great opportunities to turn paper policies into practical progress in the form of the Village Infrastructure Project VIP. Looking to intensify efforts to reduce poverty and increase the quality of life across the country, the Ghanaian government launched the VIP. There was a keen call for community participation, even during the planning phases of the project. The VIP had four main focus areas, all aligned to community concern. Ghana ranks well above others for the amount of rainfall it receives each year. But this abundance of water was not well distributed geographically and this added to the gap in equality across the country. Through the VIP, the importance of managing the country's water well was acknowledged. Government invested in and developed infrastructure for water catchment as well as water conservation activities. Before the implementation of the VIP, only 8,000 of 20,000 kilometers of road feeding into rural areas was maintained by the government. Ghana's history shows its economy was dependent on agricultural produce and in 1997, nothing much had. Moving produce and livestock from fields to farms and from farms to markets became a central focus for the Ghanaian government. This was the key to growing Ghana's economy and if the roads are ready, the supply better be steady. But the improvement of roads wouldn't just mean transporting, it would mean bumping up production to new heights. These posed a problem. Since there weren't enough quality post-harvest facility buildings where produce is stored before being transported to markets. In Ghana, to store an upscaled amount of produce before the VIP, the spoilage of harvested crops accounted for a staggering 100% of cost of harvesting. The VIP also shed light on great things to come in Ghana, things like institutional strengthening through community empowerment. While institutional strengthening may sound like a top management tax in Ghana, it was really all about giving power back to the people. It started with the redistribution of administrative responsibilities to 110 district assemblies. Shifting power from national to district level, the DAs were assigned to the highest authority at the local level and were responsible for providing basic education, public health, environmental protection and sanitization. To do this, the constitution dedicated 10% of the GDP of the activities of DAs. This was known as the District Assembly's Command Fund, DACF. Each DA was appointed an agricultural coordinator from the community to push post-harvest infrastructure and other agricultural activities. This allowed rural communities to settle into managing projects on the ground that would improve their own livelihoods. 
With the VIP and other initiatives well on the way, the world could see how good governance got Ghana steering towards sustainable development. The gains made in Ghana can bring hope to many in a challenging situation. But keeping up progress while protecting natural resources can be a tricky balancing act. In fact, two years ago, the World Resources Institute, WRI, showed that Ghana was one of the top 10 countries increasingly losing sweets of its rainforest. Interestingly, the rainforests are being cleared to grow cocoa crops, which has again become a major commodity for export in Ghana. And even though Ghana's economy has boomed over the past few years to dip again last year, which it did, this turn in the side of Ghana's success seems to come from a struggle with sustainability. Yes, Ghana has built the idea of sustainability in its economic reform programs, but promises on paper don't always filter down to the ground, except where there is good governance. In the Overseas Development Institute's review on Ghana's agricultural growth, making farming environmentally sustainable. By conserving resources of soil, forests and biodiversity, which was described as a key challenge. Working in its favor, Ghana made moves towards the UN SARCs before these goals were even completed in 2015, showing Ghana's history of committing to sustainability. And it stayed true to that history having rolled out tons of programs in every sector to address its issues with sustainability. A mission capacity building project and multiple projects aimed at educating communities on sustainable forestry and water use. This goes to show that Ghana has the good governance and sustainable development stride that it needs to get its economy back on track as long as it sticks to sustainable progress. Thanks for watching this video and if you enjoyed it, please leave a like and also don't forget to subscribe and become part of our family here at Think Rich Africa. Hit that notification bell so not to miss out on any of our upcoming videos.